supply chain and quality at Whirlpool. Uh, he heads the Whirlpool's North American Integrated Supply Chain and Quality Organizations. Uh, amounts, amongst his uh, accountabilities is leading the execution of the company's Invested in America strategy, uh, which includes investment of over a billion dollars in U.S. manufacturing. And uh, I hope we hear how much of it is going to Indiana. Okay, <laughs> welcome. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully we'll have some, can you hear me okay? All right. Hopefully we'll have some audio and video here in just a second. I'm the difficult one in the group. My, our company uh, is a Google company at this point, so we're using Google Slides, Google Sheets, and so I did not follow the PowerPoint uh, format, so we're trying to get Google Slides going here. So it's either gonna be a presentation or it's gonna be shadow of puppets and, uh, and jokes here in a minute. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. It's a great pleasure to be back uh, back here at Purdue. I, I apologize, I was not able to attend the whole day with you guys. I had a chance to um, speak over at the Craner Business School uh, this morning to a group of students as part of the executive forum. And it's a great opportunity for me to, to hear kind of what's going on at Purdue, what's on students' minds. And uh, it's always a great treat to come back to Purdue. And especially today, because I get to talk about uh, manufacturing at Whirlpool, which is something very near and dear to my heart. So we'll see, we'll see if we can get this up and running here. Hey, all right, it works. So again, uh, once again, I'm Jim Kepler. I have responsibility for the integrated uh, supply chain function uh, at Whirlpool. What that means is if we build it, if we ship it, that's under my responsibility. Um, I have the pleasure for working for a great company. And for those who don't know much about uh, Whirlpool, we are uh, the number one uh, home appliance manufacturer in the world. Uh, we have a leading position in pretty much every market around the world. Uh, we're gonna do about 21 billion uh, in annual revenue this year. And uh, you probably know us by uh, our brands in this market, uh, outside of Whirlpool, uh, Maytag, Gen Air, KitchenAid, and Amana. And then we have uh, a whole assortment of other brands uh, that are represented in markets outside of the US. So we are a global company. Uh, we're gonna ship and pre we're gonna sell and ship about 70 million uh, units around the globe. That's both major appliances and countertop uh, appliances. Uh, again, you can kind of see the representation of around the globe. Uh, we currently have uh, 70 manufacturing and tech centers uh, in various countries throughout the world. And again, we are, we are we're very much founded here in the U.S., but a global uh, leader. So we're invested in America. We, we talk about our invested in America strategy. Um, it's, it's vogue at this point for manufacturers to, uh, to onshore bring product back bring manufacturing back to the US. Uh, kind of our story is we never left in the first place. Uh, about 80% uh, of what we sell in the US market, we actually, actually produce here. Uh, it's been pretty consistent over the last couple of decades. Uh, typically, you'll see us producing certain countertop appliances, microwaves, uh, outside of the US, but most of our major uh, appliances are produced here in the US. Um, if you look at U.S. homes between uh, our small appliances, countertop appliances, and major appliances, we are present in three out of four homes uh, here in the U.S. And so our manufacturing footprint consists of nine U.S. facilities. Uh, these are big facilities. Uh, our largest facility is in Clyde, Ohio, about 1.7 million square feet under roof. Uh, we are currently producing about 24,000 residential washers a day out of that facility. So a very high speed uh, facility, about 3,500 employees. So today's manufacturing, I know you guys probably have talked about some of this today, it's not your grandfather's manufacturing. We, uh, it's no longer a, a dark, dingy, dangerous place to work. 
Our factories are modern, they're well lit, uh, the latest technology is present. Uh, you're gonna see varying degrees of lean being applied, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Uh, but let me, let me just show you quickly, um, a, just a quick video, we call it Clyde Pride. This talks about, uh, this is kind of some testimonials from our, our largest facility in Clyde, Ohio. I have audio. Okay. All right. I apologize. We'll, we're going to pause out of this. really where the action happens. This is the heartbeat of Whirlpool. Clyde, Ohio makes the best washers in the world. I get here about 5.30 every morning. I love it. I have a work family besides my personal family at home. I love working at Whirlpool. When I come in in the morning, I am excited about working here and knowing that I have a job that I can say I'm proud of. We've been the best for a long time for a reason, and it's the hard work that these folks are putting in. We call it Clyde Pride. I like to see our finished goods in customer homes. I'm proud that we make them here in Clyde, Ohio. Clyde Pride means we put out the best product ever at the most affordable cost. I really enjoy what I do. I love coming to work. I've been with Whirlpool for 15 years. I've been at Whirlpool 11 years. I've been here at Whirlpool Clyde for 18 years. 44 years right here at Clyde. I've worked here at Whirlpool for 49 years. I've worked for Whirlpool over 27 years. My husband also works at Whirlpool. My dad has worked here. My wife worked here. I've got two sisters, two brothers, one daughter that worked here, brothers-in-laws, son-in-laws, nieces, nephews, cousins. I love working here because Whirlpool is a, like a family. I especially like the fact that I've been able to grow my career. The great thing about Clyde, Ohio, in Whirlpool is the opportunities are endless. I became a team leader one, a team leader two, and now I'm a team leader three. I started here when I was 20 years old, working on midnight shift in assembly, and I decided to go back to school, and Whirlpool paid for your education. They gave me a chance to work after I got disabled. They looked at my ability, not my disability. I was proud to fight for this country. When I came back from Vietnam, I was allowed to come back to work with two years of seniority they're family oriented, they're also community oriented. We do a lot for each other. It's benefits, it's community, it's volunteerism. There are several other businesses that rely on us as their customer. We have a large draw because of the skill sets that we're looking for. It supports more communities than just Clyde. Fremont, Bellevue, we have people from Tiffin, from Norwalk, Sandusky area. I actually live in Castellia, Ohio. We make the best washer in the world. The people here are very proud of that. Those are great jobs. There's so many opportunities here that I don't plan on leaving. I want to work here for at least 15 more years. I would work here until I can't work here anymore. <laughs> I plan on retiring from here. I would like to end my career here. I do see my children coming here. They could make a career. I would love to see my granddaughter work here. We have folks that are willing to come in every day, roll up their sleeves, put in the hard work to make sure that we're keeping our customers happy. It's a work family, it, even, even more than friends. I get to build not only washes, but I get to build people every day.
Okay, so again, I, hopefully you guys can see the pride in the, in the people's uh, voices as they told their stories. This is a 65-year-old uh, facility, it's, and it's been, we've been, we've been there 65 years. The facility actually dates back into the late 1800s. So this is, this is one of those big brownfield facilities that we're trying to transform uh, at Whirlpool. It's kind of representative of what you would see from a manufacturing footprint uh, within our company. Uh, these, are, these are older facilities uh, with some age to them that are going through a transformation, which I'll talk about here in just a second. So manufacturing uh, matters in our communities. Uh, we are we're typically located uh, in small Midwestern towns that really uh, depend on us as the predominant tax base. Uh, our employees uh, give back in a lot of different ways. We, probably the most philanthropic company I've ever worked for, uh, we give back both uh, in hours of volunteer. Our employees give very generously. Uh, we have a couple of nationwide signature charities which our company supports. Uh, every habitat build around the world uh, has a refrigerator and a freestanding range uh, from Whirlpool. Uh, you will also see uh, global sponsorship from United Way. Our employees, for every dollar they contribute, uh, the company matches dollar for dollar. So uh, very active in our local communities and the manufacturing uh, is the heartbeat of, of many of these small communities. Our company really has a rich entrepreneurial heritage. Uh, we were started uh, as the Upton Machine Company back in 1911 uh, in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Uh, our, our two founders, uh, Lou Upton and his brother, are, are actually the great-grandfather and great-uncle of Kate Upton. You may know the supermodel Kate Upton. But we were founded with very humble beginnings uh, in a machine shop in Benton Harbor. Our very first product was the Ringer Washer. And we were able to, to get that into the Sears and Roebuck uh, catalog in the early 1900s, and the rest is history. Uh, we've enjoyed uh, a long heritage and a long history here in the US. You can see some of the other uh, brands and other companies that we've acquired uh, over the years. They were all started kind of in a similar fashion. Uh, entrepreneurs who basically had an idea, uh, an invention, and brought it to life. Again, here's an example of kind of the, uh, the original ringer washer, uh, the original 15 employees at Whirlpool. Uh, we kind of call our, ourselves, in some respects, a scrappy startup. Uh, we've grown to a global enterprise that, again, is, is present really in every country around the world. And we have a legacy of innovation. You can see a lot of firsts here uh, from a product innovation standpoint. Obviously, the first ringer washer, first side-by-side -side, uh, refrigerator, first stand mixer. Uh, a lot of firsts, and that, that legacy of innovation has picked up speed, I would call it exponential, uh, over the last few years. We're seeing the, the pace of product innovation um, at a pace that we've never seen before in our industry. Uh, some of the competition that has come into our industry uh, over the last decade or so has, has been driving some of that, but quite frankly, there's, some, there's changes in consumer uh, preferences that are driving that as well. So while we have uh, tremendous activity going on from a product innovation standpoint, uh, we're trying to make sure that we're also doing the same thing on the supply chain side. Um, as a company, this is kind of, this is public, this is something you can see in our annual report, uh, but we have basically four pillars at a global level, uh, product leadership, uh, brand leadership, operational uh, excellence, and people excellence, those are kind of our four planks uh, that, that our strategic work uh, is, is kind of embedded in. Uh, our values, these are the same values that we've had since we founded the company, those are ever-changing. Um, and then we have four uh, global imperatives. I'm not gonna cover all of those, but the very last one, which is reinvent our value chain, at the heart of that uh, is our Manufacturing 2020 strategy. Uh, our Manufacturing 2020 strategy was, was um, conceived a couple of years ago, 2016. It was meant to be a five-year view on where we wanted to take our manufacturing uh, uh, footprint, our manufacturing strategy, and evolve that so that we were prepared for the future. Very simply, uh, our, our, ma our manufacturing 2020 strategy says that we want to be the global benchmark uh, for manufacturing. Uh, myself and a few members of my team uh, did some extensive benchmarking uh, back in the 2016 timeframe. And we had a chance to see some phenomenal facilities and we saw some great examples 
of lean operating systems. We saw some emerging examples of I-4.0 technology in certain locations. And we, we basically told ourselves, hey, by 2020, we want to be the company that others are going to benchmark. And that's very simply uh, how, we, how we presented this to our board of directors uh, and to our employees. Uh, at the heart of our, there's basically six elements, at the heart is a transformation of our production system. Uh, we have had a Whirlpool production system uh, for many years. We've been practicing lean for probably over 20 years. Uh, I would describe uh, the, our, man, our production system prior uh, to this as a collection of lean tools. Yes, we did Kaizen events. Yes, we had various lean activities in our factories. They were very isolated. Uh, they were very targeted on uh, improving efficiency. Uh, there was not uh, a complete management system around it. It was lacking certain elements. Uh, the biggest thing that it was lacking for us was people development. Yes, if you were involved uh, in a particular Kaizen event, we got you involved and you saw some benefit from that, but we were, we were scratching the surface. And with you know, 20,000 employees in my organization, uh, we, were not getting, we were not winning the hearts and minds of those 20,000 employees. So we said that we, that we needed to change this. We wanted to maintain our identity so we're still calling it the Whirlpool production system, but we're, we're calling it an evolution, and I'll talk, I'll talk about that in a second. The second piece, and really closely linked to this, is what we're doing from an I-4.0 standpoint. So uh, as we talk about the next industrial revolution, what are the technologies that make sense for us? How do we make sure that those are in the, in the right cadence, that they're married to lean activities? I think I heard it a couple of times uh, when I walked in, I, and, it's, and it's true, you can't automate waste, or you shouldn't automate waste, or that's wasteful in itself. So there is a cadence, uh, at least in our company, where we, we determine when something is ready to be automated. And typically, we're forcing our, time, our, our teams to do things manually, uh, to test things out. If we're talking about AGVs, uh, we're making sure that we've got established tugger routes manually and that those are efficient and running properly, proper material presentation before we try and automate anything. So that's, those two are linked very closely together. The third piece, and it was, I heard it, was, uh, heard it discussed in the last panel, is, you know, is the organizational uh, design and capability uh, is lacking. Our, our organizational design and capabilities um, were lacking prior to this to really go and attack what we wanted to attack here. And so we've made some pretty significant changes in terms of centralizing uh, certain functions and, and, and having those as uh, centers of excellence and creating core competencies there that we can leverage across all facilities. Uh, traditionally in our company, our facilities were very much decentralized. They were their own little kingdoms. You could see pockets of excellence as you walk through those factories, but there wasn't the consistency that we needed. So that's one of the things that we have done is we've moved to a more centralized model. We're also addressing the, the capability gap that we have, and it's a, it's a growing gap uh, in the U.S. It's something we face uh, in every location uh, where we do business, is being able to get skilled workers. And because of our size and scale, we've taken it upon ourselves. We have our, we've developed uh, in-house apprenticeship programs uh, for our skilled trades. We've partnered with local community colleges uh, to do, to do on-site training, and we really have taken it upon ourselves to develop people from within versus trying to hire the skill uh, outside uh, our plants. The fourth element is, uh, believe it or not, as a global company, we did not have a, a consistently applied core versus non-core strategy. Uh, in some cases, we tried to be everything to everybody, and you guys all know, who, those of you who run a business know that you can't, you don't have the resources, both capital and, and people, to do everything. You have to figure out what you're gonna be good at, what's core to your business, and then where you're gonna partner uh, with people that have that capability outside your four walls. So we, we have, we, for the first time in our, you know, 107 year old history, we finally have a globally aligned core versus non-core strategy that, that we're deploying uh, as it makes sense across the globe. The fifth element is, um, this, was, this is a connection point that it may sound basic to a few of you in the room, but for us, we were very, very separated from our product development organization. Uh, we were operating in a serial fashion. Product development would create the design, they would hand it over to manufacturing, and we would figure it out. And you guys all know how wasteful that is. Uh, we've said that of any element 
this one has the potential to be the biggest value creator for our company because uh, we're now embedding resources earlier in the product development cycle from manufacturing and we're able to tackle and identify issues much earlier before we're cutting steel on tools and locking into a process and then trying to figure it out afterwards. So this one, yeah, I think is gonna dwarf anything that we're doing from a lean standpoint. But uh, we finally have processes in place with up upfront manufacturing system design and actually co-locating certain product development teams to make sure that we've got the right input at the right times and we can actually influence a design when, you get, when you've got more, degree, more degrees of freedom earlier in the process. The last element is really simply where in the world are we gonna produce? What regions of the world uh, do we put our manufacturing plants? Uh, very simply, our strategy is to produce in the regions where we sell. We, we are building you know, big boxes that either cool, heat, or wash stuff, and it's very expensive to move that logistically uh, across regions. And so our primary objective is to build in the regions where we sell. There, there's a few, few exceptions to that, but that's the six elements. So these are the six elements of our Manufacturing 2020 strategy. And so I'm going to, in the limited time that I have, I'm going to talk about uh, these two, the production system uh, evolution and then the I-4.0 work that we're doing. So we made the decision after doing a lot of benchmarking, um, we looked at probably a dozen companies around the globe. Uh, it's interesting, every, every company who does lean well, it's some variant of the Toyota production system, and that's, that's pretty much the gold standard out there. What we found is a methodology called world-class manufacturing. Uh, it was developed in 2005 by a Japanese professor and a Fiat uh, Corporation. Um, it's now being used at Fiat Chrysler, Unilever, uh, Case New Holland, Royal Mail, Elica, some other companies. There's about a dozen companies around the globe uh, who are deploying this. The best way I can describe it is it's the Toyota production system adapted for our Western culture. And so for, for our company, it was, it was exactly what we needed because it was, there's, there's 10 technical pillars, 10 managerial pillars. There is a rigorous, disciplined approach. Uh, one of the things that we typically do, we're, we're cowboys, we're like, we're like other US manufacturers. We sometimes wanna go wide before we go deep. We wanna spread before we have mastery in a certain area. And this methodology forces us to follow a seven step process that that doesn't allow you to move into and expand into areas before you're ready to do so. So we like the complete management system it brings. We have the ability as part of this WCM association of companies to get um, companies from, uh, from these, from these uh, sister organizations to come in and audit our facilities. So the, the expectation is every six months, our facilities will go through, it's, it's a very rigorous external audit and it's, we're, we're being compared against a standard that's now common across these, these companies. And there's been some tremendous learnings for us as we've went through these audits. Uh, World-class manufacturing, so again, I kind of described what WPS was to us prior to this transformation. It is, uh, safety was very much a priority. It was very much uh, part of what we did. It was not part of our management system. And we, we, we decided, uh, as, an, as an organization that we could never claim benchmark status or claim world class if our safety was not where it needed to be. And so the safety approach here uh, really is driving us to more proactive, looking at leading indicators, forcing us to begin measuring things that we never measured before. We're looking at unsafe acts, we're looking at unsafe conditions, we're, me we're truly measuring first aid cases and near misses uh, in our facility so we can try and head off uh, those recordable and those lost time accidents, heaven forbid, something more severe than that. Uh, the voice of the customer, uh, we, we have through the, the quality assurance matrix that is part of this methodology, we're able to identify at the line with, uh, and operators are part of this, they know exactly where those critical to quality stations are and there's no, there's, there's no secret, there's no, uh, this isn't a front office exercise, our folks on the floor know how they can influence uh, things that are important to our customers. Uh, the lead, our leaders, and when I say leaders, the thing that we're trying to do here is really flip the organization upside down. So we talk, I think I heard a few people talk about the servant leadership model, but we're real, when I go into a factory now and I, and, I, and I go and I talk to our leaders, 
I, I don't want to hear the report out from the operations manager. I want to go to the team leader in that area, and I want the team leader to tell me what's really going on. And I want the team leader to tell me what they need to be successful and what they're not getting. And we basically are going to serve them, not the other way around. So we really, uh, to, to do that, we're driving a much uh, different rigor in terms of bill of process and standards across our factories. Uh, no form of waste is acceptable uh, with this methodology. Our goal is zero accidents, zero downtime, zero inventory, the list, the list goes on. And again, those are aspirational, of course, but zero is the number that we're, that we're striving towards. And we've been very clear that that's going to be our target. We will have milestones uh, on, our, on, on our path there, but zero is the magic number. Uh, faults are made visible and opportunities are, are, are problems are really treated as opportunities. I think everybody knows that uh, in a really good lean environment, uh, problems are treasured. They're not hidden, they're not swept under the rug, they're surfaced, they're identified, uh, there's problem solving, there's a help chain, and you attack those and you get them fixed. Uh, this is a big cultural sh uh, shift for Whirlpool. This is not, this is not uh, typically how we have behaved in the past, and so this is a big cultural shift as people surface problems to not come down on them, to treat them as treasures and attack them in the right way. And then I mentioned that pe the people involvement is really what's gonna drive the change. This was probably the single biggest ingredient for me as I talked to companies that had been using this methodology uh, for a while is the, the change in the people. Uh, again, the ability to go out and talk to team leaders and see those team leaders uh, owning their part of the business, telling you exactly what was going on, visible metrics, uh, being able to articulate where they needed help and in owning it. And uh, that's what we have to get to. We've, we've said collectively in our organization, if we can really tap into those you know, 20 plus thousand people in our organization and get them thinking the same way, uh, the, the opportunities are, are endless. And again, the WCM approach, so if you walk into any of our Whirlpool facilities around the globe, you're going to see different, different points of evolution with our production system. Every facility has model areas underway. And the idea there is you pick, we have a, a cost deployment matrix that we use, which basic, basically catalogs all the losses for the factory. We prioritize those as to which are the biggest drivers, and we, we go after those first. And the model areas for each of, whether it's safety, quality, uh, workplace organization, um, those are all, those model areas are established based on that data. And there's a seven step process for how you move through those model areas. You do not move into expansion areas until you prove mastery and you prove uh, consistent results in that model area, you don't spread. So we have some facilities that have been on the same model area for six months now. We have others that have been able to progress a little bit quicker, but it's basically, uh, you let the data basically tell you how fast you can, you, can, you can progress. This is a big change for us as well. I mentioned earlier, we, we as a company, we had the tendency to sometimes want to move fast, move rapid, uh, before we had any type of stability or any mastery in a particular area. Great, you might see some, re you might see some flash results, but sure enough, if you didn't get to the root cause and solve problems, that they were going to come back at some point. So that's what we're trying to, to achieve here. Let me transition just quickly into uh, Industry 4.0. I don't know if you guys talked about that this morning. Um, you know, a lot of buzz around this over the last, last several years to, to, to describe the next uh, industrial revolution. Um, lots of uh, sexy concepts like 3D printing, big data analytics, uh, so on and so forth. What we decided to do as a company is we said that this absolutely had to be part of our strategy. Uh, this was not going to be the first thing that we went and did. Obviously, lean, certain lean things have to happen first uh, before you can try and introduce any of this. You need, I think it was said earlier, you need a stable process before you can try and introduce some of this technology. We also, we have an advanced manufacturing team at, uh, at Whirlpool that's kind of the gatekeeper for each of these technologies. And I, I basically have kind of given them the, the task of telling us, telling the manufacturing teams, when are we ready for prime time on these various technologies? When is it developed to a point, the cost of implementation, when is it ready to, in, to be introduced in our factories? For example, 3D printing. Uh, we 3D print today across all of our factories. 
but we're doing end, arm tool, end of arm tooling for robots. We're doing limited production tools. We're doing jigs and fixtures. Uh, in some cases, we're doing small service parts. We have not seen a business case yet to do that on a production scale. Uh, the cost just isn't there. The technology is not advanced. So that's not, you won't see that as part of our uh, kind of our model technology factory. Doesn't mean that we're not working on the development of that, but it, it's not ready for prime time, so it's not gonna enter the four walls uh, of our facility. It's one example. So what we've done is we've taken, we actually chose a facility, Cleveland, Tennessee, one of our newer facilities, and we decided that we wanted to bundle, uh, there's ba basically across automation, advanced testing, uh, data visibility and analytics, and agile manufacturing, we wanted to bundle uh, use cases uh, all on one, through one assembly operation. So we basically, uh, if anybody has a KitchenAid, Maytag, Whirlpool built-in wall oven, that's what we produce in Cleveland, Tennessee. And we basically started uh, at the, you know, the raw material coming into the factory, and we've, we basically are following that all the way through uh, the, the, the cavity formation, the stamping, uh, the formation and welding of that oven cavity, all the way to the assembly of the built-in wall oven, and we've got uh, technology basically woven in all the way through to see if we can see something in a system uh, that, is, that we can leverage in other facilities. So it's a, and I'm gonna describe it first and I'll show you a quick uh, video snippet here that maybe describes it a little bit better. But again, uh, from an automation standpoint, uh, on this assembly line that builds these built-in wall ovens, uh, we have uh, a, a lot of work to do from a material presentation standpoint, getting, uh, getting tugger routes uh, established at, at the proper pitch with consistency. That work has been going on for the past couple of years. We're at the point now where we're ready to automate uh, some of that. Uh, you're gonna see collaborative automation. We have probably a total of 175 collaborative robots uh, across our facilities. Uh, you'll see some select use of those uh, in this pilot um, case. Uh, advanced testing, one of the big critical parameters for us on an oven, uh, a wall oven, is the, the ribs that the racks slide in and out on. When those, if those ribs are out of spec, that rack can fall through or be too tight and can actually cause a big safety issue. And so uh, measuring the rib, uh, the rib width and the cavity width, width are very critical dimensions for us. And so I'll show you what we're doing uh, to control that in a closed loop fashion. Uh, being able to have, and th this may sound basic to a few, few of you, but for us, the data visibility piece has been huge for us. Just being able to have uh, in our constraint machines that were really impacting OE in our assembly line, having the data visible on screens, in some cases being able to now drive that closed loop uh, has made a huge difference for us. And so I'll show you some of that. And then we've got a couple of spots where we've been, we've been able to um, save on future tooling investments by doing some late product differentiation uh, using a more agile uh, manufacturing method. So let me uh, see if I can get the technology to cooperate here. Perform very fast and much more economically. And what that allows him to do is take this previous military technology that was very good at what it does, very expensive. So there, there, there's no audio with this, so I'll kind of do a play-by-play -play as we go through this. But this is in Cleveland, Tennessee. So this is the... <laughs> kind of ironic, I'm talking about i4.0 and I can't get my, uh, my, my laptop to work here. So. Anyway, so we've introduced for, that, for this rib height measurement, this, this flat piece gets wrapped into the oven cavity. We're using a non-contact laser vision system to be able to check the rib height. What we're ultimately doing here is we're actually getting, getting steel inputs from our supplier. We're able to take the, take the significant material properties and ultimately be able to, to catalog those and actually make line adjustments based on uh, variations that we see. You saw that you saw the, the, the use of barcoding to try and capture some of the quality information. This is a closed loop uh, control for weld settings uh, to be able to get the optimum weld every time. Again, all of this process data is captured on that, TD, that 2D barcode, so we're able to 
uh, go back if we do have a, 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 a one of these come back and, and find out what happened. This is actually measuring the cavity width itself uh, to ensure that nothing gets to the assembly line that's out of spec. Again, all this is being captured using the, uh, the, the 2D barcode. This is the data visibility that we have in our back shops, our stamping and, and uh, forming presses. And this is some, again, late differentiation that we're using with a bender to be able to uh, really, really lessen our tooling investment that we were spending in, in the past. And we're in the process right now of implementing Savant uh, AGVs, which will be delivering uh, material to our lines real time. Phase two of this is gonna be more of an Uber-esque approach where uh, there'll be certain types of delivery that will be based, that, that'll be done on demand from the line when needed. So it'll be staged, ready to go, and then be delivered uh, real time to the lines. So again, just a real quick, um, snapshot on what we've got going on at Whirlpool Corporation. So I realize I'm standing between you guys and the weekend, so again, thanks for your attention. Apologize for the technology uh, glitches and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend, thanks. Yeah, what, what questions can I, uh, can I answer before I exit the stage here? Good yeah. In terms of the investment itself, was there the usual capital justification or was this an article of faith? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So the, the question was on the investment. And we actually, we, we, we partnered with the Boston Consulting Group as we went out and did our external benchmarking. And we actually presented a business case uh, to our board of directors that had, I don't know, somewhere upwards of $500 million of of capital investment, and we were promising a certain return on that investment. I can tell you that we haven't, we haven't even spent a fraction of that at this point. There has been so much low-lying fruit from a lean standpoint as we've gotten into these model areas uh, in the various factories. We've been able to identify low-cost uh, automation, things that we can build in-house, especially on the material presentation side. We do all of our own creoform uh, racking. We've actually had some very creative people that have come up with designs that we used to pay for on the outside. And so the capital investment has been a fraction of what we thought it was gonna be, and we're still getting the same results. Yes. Um, so we're a little partial to Indiana business. So I, I had a question pertaining to, I like the fact that you know, you're reinvesting in some of these old plants when sometimes it's easier to go greenfield. With respect to Indiana, I, I know these are tough decisions. Could you give us a little bit of your perspective of um, some of the difficulties associated with uh, decisions like closing the parts distribution center in Laporte and the, uh, two, what, at least two plants in Evansville? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, and again, some of these decisions happened before my time, so I don't have all the details, but these are always tough decisions that we have to make. Uh, in the case of Evansville, um, Evansville produced side-by-side uh, -side top mount refrigerators. Uh, we saw the market dwindling um, in, the, in both of those markets. Uh, we had duplication of plants, and we had, we had, to, choose, we had, to, we had to pick a winner and loser in that case. In, the, in this case, it was Evansville. Uh, in the case of our parts distribution, uh, we made the decision to actually invest in another Indiana location so we've consolidated everything into Plainfield, uh, Indiana. So that's now kind of a mega center uh, for all of our service parts. So there's actually been some significant investment made in Plainfield since we made that decision. But these are things that we never want to have to do. Um, it's as we has as we've made uh, uh, and done acquisitions over the years. Um, we have been as a company traditionally slow to make make footprint decisions, and sometimes you're kind of betting on, will the market recover? Uh, will certain segments come back in vogue? And in the case of the Evansville, um, you know, we, we had just made the, 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 the Maytag uh, acquisition, which is a big investment for us, the biggest that we've ever made here uh, in the US. And we, we just had duplication of, of manufacturing footprint. We probably should have made that decision about three years earlier, but uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that that had to happen here in Indiana.
Jim, uh, you talked about your operating system change, you know, the production system being more evolutionary than revolutionary. Um, I, I assume there was a deliberate choice you made to just keep the continuity of the Whirlpool production system. But what you described is actually a fairly enormous change in terms of the operating system, what people look for, people feel, and so forth. How did you guys decide not to rebrand, first of all, and then once you decided not to rebrand, how did you make it a significant change considering it's really a, the same brand, same operating system, look and feel kind of thing? Did you have to swap out people? Did you have to bring in new people? How did you actually manage through that change? Yeah, I, first of all, it's a work in progress. Um, I'll tell you what we, we've been, we're about two years into it. And um, as a company, we didn't want to lose our identity. Um, the fact of the matter is, a lot of our employees on the shop floor didn't even know what WPS meant. They, they knew that we were doing lean events. They, they, again, they got involved periodically in Kaizans, but they didn't, they didn't really understand what WPS meant. So it's not been that big of a shift for the shop floor. Uh, for our, uh, pr our practitioners, our, our salaried folks, the uh, parts of our, our central team, um, we were trying to send the message that um, what you just did for the last 20 years is still meaningful. It still applies. Uh, the concepts of standard work and 5S and TPM, uh, all those things are not changing. But we're going to repackage this in a complete management system with a, with a different approach, uh, a different audit process, a more disciplined uh, implementation approach. And uh, I think people get that. People got, have gotten that so far. So the response has been very good. Uh, you'll, hear it, you'll hear it referred to as WCM, you'll hear it referred to as WPSE, uh, depending on what, you know, you'll just, you, but it's the same thing. And we're trying to, we, didn't wanna, we just didn't want to lose the identity, and we had a, a global discussion on that. And I think enough people felt strongly that we wanted to maintain that identity, and that there was probably low enough risk to still do what we had to do and still maintain that. So that was the decision. Okay, thank you.